Well, it's just, it's, it's flat bread and then covered in cheese and other stuff. And it smells of garlic and onion here, so which is really quite good. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a thousand tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and LA bid on Ruby developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average Ruby developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary offer of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Ruby Rogues link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hire to get a $1,337 bonus if they accept the job. Go sign up at Hire.com slash Ruby Rogues. This episode is sponsored by CodeChip.com. Don't you wish you could simply deploy your code every time you test pass? Wouldn't it be nice if it were tied to a nice continuous integration system? That's CodeChip. They run your code. If all your tests pass, they deploy your code automatically. For fast, free, continuous delivery, check them out at CodeChip.com. Continuous delivery made simple. This episode is sponsored by Rackspace. Are you looking for a place to host your latest creation? Want terrific support, high performance, all backed by the latest open source cloud? What if you could try it for free? Try out Rackspace at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace and get a $300 credit over six months. That's $50 per month at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace. Snap is a hosted CI and continuous delivery that is simple and intuitive. Snap's deployment pipelines deliver fast feedback and can push healthy builds to multiple environments automatically or on demand. Snap integrates deeply with GitHub and has great support for different languages, data stores, and testing frameworks. Snap deploys your application to cloud services like Heroku, DigitalOcean, AWS, and many more. Try Snap for free. Sign up at snapci.com slash rubyrogues. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Jessica Kerr. Good morning. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. I just want to remind you to go check out jsremoteconf.com. It's an online JavaScript conference. Jessica will be speaking at it. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I should have the schedule up by the time this episode goes out, so go check it out. Uh, we also have a special guest this week, and that is Peter... Okay. Hinchens? <laughs> Hinchens is good. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? Sure, Chuck. Peter Hinchens. So I am the CEO of Imatix and the founder of the Zero MQ community. And my speciality is community building. I'm an author and a programmer and a father of three lovely children. Very cool. And a maker like of fun. pizza. Oh, we're making pizza right now, yeah. We're not talking about food. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So we brought you on to talk about community building. In particular, are you more about like organizing people at, say, conferences or events or online communities? Well, we've done a lot of events and conferences as well, but mostly it's online communities. I guess it started in the area of actually political activism. We were fighting software patents in Europe around 2005, and we had to do a lot of campaigns and a lot of volunteer organization, which is very difficult. From that, we learned really how to build communities, and we're using that in, in open source projects starting in 2007 in, in anger for Zero MQ. Peter, what is Zero MQ? It's really cool. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, Jessica, it's a community. Uh, that's what I would describe it now. It's, it's also software and technology and protocols to do with building distributed systems. But what it really is, is a community of people who like and who know how to build distributed systems in all kinds of languages, all kinds of platforms. So it's from everything from large clouds to embedded devices. Oh, I'm, And it's I'm, really about the protocols and standards for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm much more familiar with the technology. I, you said it was a community and I was like, Oh, I, didn't know about that. Yeah. But it's cool software, so. That's, it's cool software. Very, it's very interesting that you say it's a community first and software second. When uh, we started ahead. the project in 2007, there was actually were two parallel projects. One was building a software library, which was done by my friends Martin Sustrich and his team in, in Slovakia. And then my work was building a community around the around software or to build the software, really. And that was a, a separate project with its own structure and, you know, a whole, a whole bunch of tactics and strategies, the licensing, the contribution policy, how we would see it. Um, it took several years for that to really develop properly, but I think that's successful. There was really a formula that we want to build this community using these, these approaches and things like making it very easy to contribute, having a very, very clear contribution policies, which still took some years to develop into real working tools. 
So, wow, so the community is like a parallel process to the software development. Mm-hmm. Parallel but intertwined? Well, I think kind of to summarize it, we, we built the first version that you know by ourselves, just the brute force, if you like. And it makes interesting software. It's very fast, but it's very strange and rather complex. And this attracts enough people to build a community who can then together build the real thing years and years of work later. Wow. Right? What did you bring from your political online organizing into the software community? How is it the same? How is it different? So it's interesting that the political organization was also, like any NGO, you'll see lots and lots of struggles over control and power and who has the right to start a campaign, who owns the, the collective, you know, intellectual property, the, the, the goodwill and so on. And the NGOs that I was involved in and I was actually in charge of for a couple of years were, were completely riven by conflict over ownership and power. Very toxic, in fact. And it was very clear that if you could resolve the problems of power and money, then you would enable the majority of goodwill people simply to work together on stuff they wanted to work on, they were able to work on. And so you had the same in open source software where you have dominant individuals who can be very toxic to the, you know, the quiet goodwill masses, if you like. And so it took a long time to actually prove that. That was this theory in the beginning. And in, in open, in ZeroMQ, we saw that very clearly at a certain point at a fork where the dominant individuals left the project and made their own stuff, which then died and then carried on in different shapes. And ZeroMQ became a very quiet, consensus driven, a much more organic project and much more successful. That uh, was about three years ago now. I, I'm really curious, and you know, I, I think there are some positive things about community building, but those negative elements really can affect things. How do you identify them? How do you pick them out, and then how do you handle things to make sure that they're continuing along the the way that uh, right encourages the the kind of collaboration you want? So there's there's a lot of this in my in my book. In fact, in my two books, one on zero MQ has a big chapter on community building, chapter six. And it's also a lot of background in my culture and empire book on how online communities work and why you need collective thinking rather than individual thinking. But basically there's two kinds of problem. Uh, one is conflict between well-intentioned people who have different opinions about where to go. So you have two groups who have simply different experience, different views on, on, on a problem, and they're trying to fit these two views into one box. And that creates conflict. And the answer is very simple is you let them both create their own boxes. That's all. You just fork and make space for, for creation. You don't have to have a single security mechanism. You can have many concurrent and competing security mechanisms. So you turn that kind of conflict into competition. You do that by having good contracts between layers and that solves that. That's finished. And then the second area of conflict is where you have individuals who really don't like sharing their space with other people or their success. They're very self-centered and they want to dominate the group. They want to create chaos and then profit from the chaos. I see them as cheats in a kind of a intellectual fashion. And the thing there is to remove their ability to confuse and pollute by having very clear rules and allowing people to fork the project if they want to escape that and removing, you know, the ability to make silent agreements, but the backdoor deals and so on. Like, let's all make this stuff in this direction and not give people the chance to contribute and push it. And if you do this right, then what emerges is a very organic, contract-driven, careful and slow and very accurate, it seems, um, process, thinking process. So wow. are these rules or guidelines posted somewhere, or is it just sort of understood yes, by actually. the community? Well, we found that we had to post them, because as long as they were just basically a wiki page or, you know, assumed, then people would cheat. Uh-huh. They would come and say, yeah, but, you know, according to the rules, we can do this and that. And you'd be like, yes, but, yeah, okay, okay. So... We eventually wrote the rules down as a protocol, as an RFC. I called it the Collective Code Construction Contract, I think, C4. And it's one of our ZeroMQ RFCs. It's RFC 22, in fact. And it has all the rules like, you know, you must, you may. Basically, you know, things like anybody may propose a patch. You cannot refuse a patch because you don't like it. There's no roadmap that can exclude someone's contribution, period. You know, we see every patch as an answer to a well-defined problem. The problem must be expressed explicitly. If it's just, I want to make this feature, that's not a sufficient patch, and so on. And a whole bunch of these rules that we've learned are useful. It's possibly a little bit formalistic, but it has worked very well in ZeroMQ, and it's worked in other projects as well very well to, you know, take away the kind of dominant maintainer syndrome and, and allow the crowd to to edit and make their changes. And we look at 
Wikipedia and Minecraft as being very good inspirations for how we like to make software and organize. Very free, very fun. Are those posted somewhere that we can see them online? Yes. If you just do a search for ZeroMQ RFC 22, you should find it. You said that we need collective thinking instead of individual thinking. Why is that? Well, not instead of, but as part of. The individual can only really think clearly as part of a group, and the group is... The group can work concurrently over a wide space, can see large problems from many, many angles, can divide and conquer. And it's proven, I think, that a group of people will have, you know, better decision making than individuals, especially experts who are often very distorted in their thinking. Yeah, experts so the more come expert, with, yes. Yeah. The more expert you are, Sorry. the more you need to be part of a group? I think so, yes. I think the more expert you are, the less you know about the general world and about the general usefulness of your, your, your knowledge. And that comes from the group that can tell you what's worth doing, what's worth not, what's worth not doing also, which is very important. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. So you may be an expert and know how to do everything, but that actually makes it harder to understand what you should do. And what you shouldn't do. And the really elegant things that we make are often very, very simple and come out of very slow and careful and, and wide thinking rather than intense effort by a few people. Your community is yes. built around distributed computing, and it's also about distributed thinking. Yes. yes, and we come to Conway's law where, you know, if you want to build a successful distributed system, you build a successful distributed community, first of all, or organization, first of all. Wow. So is there some form of reaching consensus here? I'm kind of browsing through this spec, and it well, says that you should seek consensus, but I don't see. Yes. Do you have some system for doing that? Take Wikipedia as an analogy. It's a very, I think it's a very similar process. You can create new areas anywhere you like. So there's no limit on where you can go and create stuff. Uh -huh. And you have people who use what you make and they, the users will get contracts from you, API contracts or protocol contracts. And the more you document and the more you put test cases around your contracts, the more people will invest in them. And then they can come with this RFC to stop other people or stop you from breaking those contracts over time. So you've published an API and the API has a certain weight and a certain use in the market. Then breaking changes are now forbidden by this, this RFC. So if someone makes a breaking change, someone else can simply revert that. So it's not just about individuals making always the right changes, but the group also coming back to fix mistakes and to stop people making stupid changes. And consensus appears, and this is our experience now in, in actually lots of projects, emerges from this quite nicely. It's still work, of course. You still have to go through and, you know, write code. Code is still work, writing code. But it's a lot less experimental and a lot less, a lot, a lot, a lot fewer failures than what we make than before, I would say. As a negative, is one of the negatives of this that if someone comes in and they want to use the software, uh, when you've got multiple people building their solutions that they, is it confusing to people who need to pick one? It doesn't seem to be. It doesn't seem to be an excessive choice. It seems to be that we have old things which go through a cycle of maturity and then they basically stop developing and then we have new versions or new, you know, reimaginings of the solution which are simpler and you know, have a better level of abstraction and which replace the old over time, which is what you'd expect and what you, what you like. In fact, that's what we want. We want new APIs to emerge while old APIs remain supported. And new APIs with better levels of abstraction to come out and then take over and become dominant. We see a lot of diversity in language choice. So people do have their languages. They have their Erlang and their Go and their C++ and they will build layers in those languages, which is fine as well. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of confusion about what to use, even though there are often three or four or five versions of something, you know, five instances of some layer it seems to work. So I want to go back to the consensus thing really quickly because I'm not completely sure I understand. Basically, somebody can submit a patch and it can be put in and then eventually it'll be pulled out if it doesn't meet these other criteria or if the community, mm -hmm. you know, reacts to it in a way that makes it come out. I think it's, it's turned out to be a valid rule that 80% of patches are good. Uh huh. Hmm. And 20% are bad in some way, either by mistake or they're uh, just the person who's making it does not understand. And in a very small number of cases, contributors are actually, I would say, pathological. I mean, they make, they do stuff which is really traumatizing to other people. So 
the very bad stuff is relatively easy to catch and take out. You see way too large changes. They're obviously not following the process. They're obviously not reading the RFC. They're not taking care. So if the person insists on doing that, we ban them after a while. We say, okay, this is too much change. You're not following the process. You're not reading the rules. You're actually accusing us of being bad at maintaining because we're merging your patches. You're off. And the rest, the the thing is to get, sorry. Yeah, you said they accuse you of being bad at maintaining for merging yeah, their this patches. Happens. Do yeah, this happens. So you merge their bad patches. <laughs> So then, well, if you take the other, the other 95% or the other 99%, then the trick is to merge as fast as possible. You merge to master without doing code reviews and without, as long as it passes the tests and as long as it doesn't look, you know, actually insane, you merge it. And by merging it, you've forced it into the front. Everybody will look at it. It will be tested on many systems and it will fail. People will be engaged to come and fix it and improve it. And so, People who are goodwilled contributors will learn very rapidly if they've made mistakes. And the 80% of good patches just go straight into master correctly. And then the 20% become urgent because you just put them in master. You force people to look at them and you've given, I would say, both sides an incentive to go and look at this code now rather than leave it for six months. How many people are part of the ZeroMQ community? Well, on the core library, it's maybe a 100. 150 contributors, 170 contributors, but there are hundreds of projects around zero MQ now. So it's, I don't know, several thousand people, I would say overall. It's very distributed. It's hard to keep track of it all. You don't try. Wow. What's the diversity of the community mm. like? In terms of technological diversity, it's very, it's very diverse. Every single possible language you can imagine is there in platforms. In terms of geographic, it's fairly diverse. A lot from, I would say, every continent except from Africa. Not very much from Africa, but that's because the internet hasn't gone very far yet there. And in terms of gender, it's almost all guys. I have no idea why that is, but it's very diverse otherwise, but not gender. All of open source, right? Seems like it. All of technology to a large extent, when it comes to hard technology, it seems to be very almost distasteful. And I think I wrote a blog about that, and I think I figured out why eventually it's distasteful to, to women in, in such a scale. Really? Yeah. Why? And it's not because, well, because most technology is, is, is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and women are just not so stupid as to spend years of their life buying into utter rubbish. And they're like, you know, come on, we have better things to do than this. But young guys have no taste and they're willing to spend 20 years learning the most arcane nonsense just to be able to, you know, one-up each other. Hey, I know this new stuff. And I think that's it. I think the problem with technology is the magical thinking that's gone, you know. Wow. All I have to say is that my wife's bullshit meter works way better than mine. So you're probably right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, There is that sort of suspension of disbelief. Yes. Uh, Yes, exactly. that's That's kind of the essence of being a geek, isn't it? An irrational yes. level of interest in yes. something. Yes, yes. And, and, and the willingness to spend years experience. and years and years learning the most arcane nonsense just to be able to spout keywords at someone else and beat them. You know, it's, it's magic. It's wizardish. <laughs> and this magic wizardish technology thing has, I think, has put women off. And I think justly, I think it's a very wise decision not to go and invest that much effort in, in rubbish. That makes sense. And it goes back to, um, at the beginning, you said that there are are some people who just are in the community in order to play the political game, in order to steal other people's intellectual property and call it theirs? Yes. Yes. That very, I mean, yeah, that happens in any successful project, I would say. Some people try that. What do you do when those people, when people who are trying to jockey for position and be ahead of other people, what do you do when they're also contributors? and actually put some good code in? Oh, you ban them. Their patches aren't important to you? No, 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 not at all. I mean, if they're actually hurting people, and that's, if, you know, if I get a distress call from someone saying, Peter, I'm not enjoying myself on this project anymore, Ah. I take that very, very seriously. I take that very seriously. There's, process is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be very much this kind of, you know, learn, play, work, teach cycle where it's it's fun. It's like Minecraft. It should be addictive and it should be fun. And when someone is doing harm to other people, giving them stress and anxiety and hurting them even in, in the low, low doses, then I, I get very perky and I get very defensive. Mama Bear comes out and starts looking around <laughs> and who's doing this? And I don't care how good their code is. And often their code is very well argued and very interesting, but it's hurting somebody. 
And if one person says, I am feeling pain, that means 10 people aren't saying anything, but they're just going away. That's true. That's true. Because there's, there's that right. small contribution of their yeah. interesting code that you can see. But what you don't yeah. see is all the contributions that you're missing out on because that exactly. person is there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I call this pain driven development and it's very important to be sensitive to pain and to pick up on your own pain, other people's pain and to ask people all the time, are you having fun? Is this pleasant for you? You know, how pleasant is this on a scale from one to 10? And if it's not, let's talk about it and let's make this more enjoyable. And I think the pain is always a sign of friction, whether it's confusion or bad assumptions or people being unpleasant. And community building is largely about identifying friction and removing friction. I think it's interesting. I was going to ask you if it was in this uh, contract, the uh, collaboration contract. And uh, yeah, it is. And I just want to read this because this is probably one of the best explanations of really what a bad actor is that I've seen. And it says, administrators should block or ban bad actors, which is in quotes, uh, who cause stress or pain to others in the project. That's pretty clear. And then you clarify it further. Uh, this should be done after a public discussion with a chance for all parties to speak. A bad actor is someone who repeatedly ignores the rules and culture of the project, who is needlessly argumentative or hostile, or who is offensive and who is unable to self-correct their behavior when asked to do so by others. And it is pretty broad or general, but you know, there are specific behaviors that are called out. And I really just like the fact that, you know, the community, again, there's a public discussion, everybody gets to weigh in. And then if, if somebody won't fix it, then they're gone. Right. I like the focus on the others. Yep. It's not about whether the actor intended to cause pain. It's about whether others felt the pain. Yes, that's right. Well, the other thing here is that I've also seen some open source projects that kind of devolve because there are the core folks who are actually correct. And by correct, I mean the points that they're making are actually right, but the way that they do it causes pain to other people because they're argumentative right. or hostile or, you know, they use offensive language or they're just, you know, they're just mean to people and, you know, treat them like, you know, like they're less or stupid or something. And yeah, it, it hurts the project more than it helps it, even if they have the right idea conceptually for the project. Yeah, you can be right and also be not worth having around. Yes. That's and, right. And we've all worked with that person. Yes. Uh, I can I can pretty much guarantee it. If you've been in software for more than a year, you've worked with that person. Yeah, and Peter's and the reason, right. The symptom is yeah. I'm not excited about going to work. That's yeah. right. And it should be fun. I think that's it. I think it should be enjoyable. And I think that we should be much more, I think we're, we're so desensitized to, to pain and we're almost taught to endure pain, you know, through school and university and, and, edu and work. The pain is part of it. And that's why we're paid and we get holiday to escape pain and so on. I think that's bullshit. And I think that we have to be much more aware of the joy of working with other people and how most people are great to work with. And then we're able to pick up on the bad actors and, and say, look, you stop it. You know, we, we know what you're doing and you can make as many excuses as you like. And you're still basically hurting other people. Can what we apply that? this to government? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, the, I write a lot about this kind of stuff. What about the people? It mentions unable to self-correct their behavior when asked to do so by others. What do you do with people who really do want to be nice and contribute, but just when they mess up. To be honest, we don't see that. And what we see are people very quickly finding the right place to contribute. If they're able to go anywhere, they'll find the right place to contribute. They will naturally look for guidance and mentoring to do things the right way. They'll be highly sensitive of their reputation and the way they're seen by other people. So if there's clear <laughs> rule book, People will ask for it and they'll follow it and they'll be, if you tell them one time, look, you know, your code was ugly or your patch was confusing, your commit messages were wrong. They'll be like, oh, oh, how can I fix that? And they'll be really, really upset that they did something wrong and they'll try to make it better. That's the, you know, the 95% case. So these people, the good contributors are worried about their reputation, but they're not worried about their power level. They couldn't care less about the power level. They want this to work and they want to be part of a, of a happy, they're playing Minecraft, right? And well, and we're and doing it for, to, for to, free, the contribution, yeah. so it had better be fun. Well, well, they're using ZeroMQ in their work most of the time. I mean, ZeroMQ is, I was three quarters built during working hours. But even so, people do care about their work. And I think that's, I think that's the common thing. I think we want people to like working with us. Otherwise, we end up being alone. 
It was no fun. I, I want to ask a question as a community organizer, I guess, or maintainer, administrator. I mean, we have a community for this show. Um, I have a few other communities that I'm either involved in or help administer. And it's really hard to be the guy that comes in and says, look, you know, we've, we've had the discussion. You're not changing. You're not fixing it. And so you have to go. I mean, how do you, how do you handle that? How do you handle asking somebody to leave? I mean, eventually you just wind up banning them, yeah. but is there so a this way is why to do I it? do it publicly. This is why I do it publicly. Okay. So I've done this a few times now, and I basically, I realize the guy's going to be banned anyway, right? He's, he's obviously not adapted his behavior, and he's blamed, started blaming other people and try mm-hmm. to, you know, say this is your fault for your rules are rubbish and so on. And it's been, it's like, you know, we go, we, we let it happen until it's really, really visible. And then I hold a trial basically by email list. And I make my accusations with some references and then I ask for comments and I ask and I say, okay, let, 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 let the person who's being accused come forward and he will, and he will not apologize and he will not say, I'm sorry. He will start blaming other people. Hmm. Then I will ban him. Wow. It's and like, a, it's I like you've community. seen this movie and, before. <laughs> Cause that's, yes. that's almost yes. exactly how it goes down every time. Have that's you right, ever had the time. situation where the person who's, who's feeling hurt, who's not having fun, would be further harmed or embarrassed or traumatized by making it public, by the public discussion? I think it's good for people to express their pain. And I think I, I do this very easily as to, as a, almost as a, to teach people to be, you know, open about, about this kind of thing. We don't have to accept bad behavior. I literally don't have to accept it. We can say, look, this is causing us pain and grief and we don't like it. We're not enjoying it. And actually we're unhappy and this has to stop. And I think that is absolutely okay to say that when it's shared by a few people. I think one, one's own feelings are often distorted. So I always ask other people what they're thinking. And I, I base on that, never my own personal opinion. So um, the scenario I'm actually trying to get at is what if it was sexual harassment and the victim didn't want to make it public and is like hesitant to report it at all for fear of um, mm. having to talk about this in public when it, it that just makes it worse, makes the um, pain prolonged. Okay, so if there's some, some kind of if there's some kind of personal uh, yeah, targeting personal. going on, that's different, and I think that falls outside the scope of a community discussion. I think there you have to invoke authority and execute authority pretty much outside the community discussion because you can't teach people how to, I don't know if you can teach people how to not sexually harass. I think that's either obvious or not obvious. You either respect your colleagues or your people on the, in the community or you, or you don't. I don't think that's the thing that you can suddenly learn by watching other people being punished. Right. Mm. I don't know. I've never faced that to be honest. So I have, I'm just blabbing here. Right. Well, I've, right. I've but- been a, I've been a manager a couple of times and you know, and had to deal with this a couple of times. And it's really tricky because a lot of times it's hard to do anything without any real evidence. So if nobody else saw anything right. or witnessed anything, then it's, it's, you know, this person's word against the other person's word. Right. And, and that makes it hard. And then the other thing is, is that, you know, some things are clearly over the line. And so when, when some, somebody steps that far over the line, it's like, look, you know, this is very clearly not okay. And so we have to remove you from, from I mean, the community. But, right. you know, then there are other things where, you know, maybe somebody got comfortable with somebody else who liked to flirt with the line. And so mm-hmm. when they behaved in that way with somebody else who didn't like to flirt with that line, they crossed it without, you know, necessarily realizing that what they said or did right. could have been construed that right. way. And right. so in those cases, you know, a lot of times you can't say, look, this is very not cool. And, you know, if you get anywhere close to the line again, we're going to have to remove you. But, you know, those are situational. And 99% of the time, in my experience, it's it's usually the former. The, they know where the line is. They stepped over it. And, yes. You know, but yes. those other cases, you know, you sit down, you talk to everybody. You make sure that everybody feels safe. You make sure that everything is handled properly. And then you react accordingly. But it, it's hard because you want members of your community to feel safe. You want them to feel like they can contribute. Mm. You want them to be involved. And that goes both for acting in a sociable manner without being accused of anything, as well as a place where you can actually come and be yourself and not be harassed or right. attacked for being different. And so I mean, the thing, 
any any situation with two people, basically it's impossible to solve that. You can you can never tell who's telling the truth and who's lying if it's word against word. <laughs> and in fact, the problem is that very often when you have an actually an abusive situation, the person who is complaining the most is the abuser. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean sexual harassment. I mean, in general, when you have in a situation with an abused and abuser, abusive person, and these are fairly common, then it's the abuser who is the most vocal and who's often claiming being the victim, the loudest. And the abused, abused person will often just be depressed and quiet and just numb. That's the way it often goes. Yeah. And it's very hard as an outsider to intervene in that situation. So the first thing is with abusers, what you need is the word of many people. Yep. You need to have at least two and, and hopefully three or four reports which point to one person being a bad actor when it's that kind of abuse. Yep. And then you can act. That's the first thing. And if it's word against word, then you have to teach people to define borders and to record evidence. If there are abusive emails or chats being sent, they have to be recorded. And that counts as evidence. And it's what you do if you go to the police and say, look, I'm, you know, my wife, my husband is beating me. Well, okay, let's, let's get a, a doctor certificate. Let's get a, a video of this. The word is not enough. It's simply not enough because that can be itself abused by, by abusive people. Yeah. One other thing I want to talk about with uh, sexual harassment really quickly, and that is, is that in a lot of cases, the victim is when, when you're asking them what happened, you're basically putting them in a position where they have to go back through all of the feelings of embarrassment and, you know, helplessness and things that they went through when the uh, harassment occurred. And so it's often very difficult for them to talk to because it is so emotionally heavy. It just weighs on them. Right. There's a cost to reporting. Yes. And so okay. mm -hmm. th that's exactly mm -hmm. it. That I, I don't know if I could have said it better. But so, you know, it, it takes a certain level of being sensitive and it's often uncomfortable for the people, person who it's being reported to as well. And so it's often very hard to know what to do about it because you don't want to put somebody in a position where they feel unsafe again so that you can solve well, the problem. I believe there's a cost to not reporting, which is much higher, yes. in fact. And I think that you can teach people to define boundaries. And this is what we do. I mean, with our rules, we're basically doing this by proxy. We teach people to define the boundaries very clearly and to signal violations very clearly. And it's the thing you can teach people even to stop this kind of, you know, slow uh, erosion of borders, uh, which becomes harassment. Yeah. You know, there's when a boundary. You it's it. When you can talk about it, when you can have a discussion yes. about feelings, yes. that helps yes. a lot. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I'm afraid I might have cut you off, Jessica. Was there something else you were going to say? Oh, I've got a bunch of things to say, but I don't remember if it was anything in particular. <laughs> okay. I, I actually have like a whole list of questions. I think in any in any group, there, there is a thing about bad actors and finding bad actors. And there's a lot of ways that bad actors can express themselves. And often it takes research to find them, but you do see pain. Mm-hmm. You do see pain and you see people being stressed mm -hmm. and you do need to be very careful about not jumping to conclusions and not allowing it to become a witch hunt because you will often pick up on the wrong people by that doing that. But I think this is a common, a consistent thing with authority in a group is to, is to, you know, consistently monitor for bad actors and, and keep them away from the good and good contributors and good participants. So I want to change the topic a little bit unless there's so something else that we need to talk about with bad actors. I do have one question that a Ruby Rogues Parlay participant asks this question. When we don't tolerate people who struggle to be sensitive to the feelings of others, there's like autistic people and there's just people who aren't very good at, at social situations and empathy. When we don't tolerate them, are we being intolerant? Hmm. <laughs> are we excluding, I mean, can we say we want an inclusive community and yet ban people? Oh, well, yes, I mean, I have a question. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, that's <coughs> obviously what I think the answer is, but it's, it's a real question that mm -hmm. people have of, is it hypocritical to exclude people for cursing or something? So I have a blog post where I wrote that something like the economics of evil, where I'm, I'm claiming, and I do believe this, that you need bad actors in the community. You need them to be in the community or you need them to show up and be kicked out? Both. Hmm. So it's not just, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I think I, I love all people equally. <laughs> and that includes bad actors who are innocent at heart. Even the worst psychopaths are innocent at heart. And what they do, although they do, they do harm and hurt individuals is they actually do 
drive the community to be more organized and more social and more care for, caring for each other. And so I actually, this is why I say in our contribution policies, everyone has a right to contribute. Everyone has a right to contribute. And I may, it may turn out that eventually you're banned, but you, everyone has the right to come in and make a mess and show them, show themselves. And I believe that bad actors are essential. They're the vitamin that keeps the rest of human culture going ahead happily. Keep us on our toes. Keep us on our toes. Yes. Well, and force us to think about these issues because we're faced yes. with them. Yes. And forces us to be more social and more open to good actors and, and more collaborative. And that's our superpower as a species. So I think bad actors have been our driving force in humanity, as in any social species. So they drive for evolution. So yeah, I have a lot, a lot of blogging about this, Jessica. Yeah, I love your. <laughs> I, I picked your post about this on Ruby Rogues some weeks ago. So, so I, some some yeah. listeners have probably read it. Yeah, we're we're getting close to a question that I do have, and that is, we we've talked about bad actors and you know getting rid of bad actors, um, but I'm I'm really curious, how do you encourage or promote the effort of your good a actors or your best actors? You know, the people who are involved that are contributing the most or doing good things. I mean, do they naturally rise to the top because the community kind of rallies behind them? Or are there things that as administrators of a community, you know, you or I could do to kind of promote what they're doing because we, right. we like it? So what we found that works is allowing people to create the structure that they like best. Okay. And that means within the Serum Q community, which is a, it is, I guess it's a GitHub organization, to start their own projects in there. And you will see that there's a small section of people who are very good at leading new projects who are able to, you know, think of the whole, the whole thing, think of their users, think of the architecture, think of the technical structure, understand the licensing, understand the whole space and kick off projects. And uh, giving them space to do this with inside the Zero Key community is very powerful, making that very fast and very smooth and letting the market then decide. And you get this basic economic model of division into specialities and then competition and collaboration between specialists. And the competition is not political competition. It's, it's both of you go create. That's right. And in fact, if you look at the Zero MQ mailing list, which is a very interesting mailing list over the last years, you will see in the last three years almost no arguments at all, none. Wow. It's active, but no arguments, no fighting, nobody with any strong difference of opinion. And the last time that we had differences of opinion was when we had our, our old gang of core maintainers who, who, you know, disappeared and did something else. When they left, all the fighting left with them. Oh, that's interesting. So, yes. And then you've and made I measured, that yes. lack of fighting carefully. Not by any conscious effort, except whenever there's a an argument, I say, aha, there's friction. That's a problem to solve. Let's go and find it. So the argument becomes a clue to something that could be improved in the system. Yes. Not It's either somebody with a mistaken mm -hmm. assumption or hasn't read it properly or there is a problem in the rules that we have to improve so this you know this banning of bad actors i added the last time we had a, we had somebody who was clearly causing pain let, let but me for the most part there's let, yeah. let me appear to or be shocked you mean it's a communication problem <laughs> yeah. communication and you mentioned changing the rules which changes the <clears> system <throat> without being anything wrong with any person how do you go about changing sometimes the rules? people have assumptions uh, I edit the wiki page. <laughs> well, well, I guess I guess what it means I is publish that... a new RFC. It's... <laughs> yeah, can there you anyone, go. Can anyone make a pull request against the rules? Yes, of course. Uh, one of the questions uh, the that rules. I saw go across Twitter the other day, uh, there was a discussion about codes of conduct. I was going to ask you why you don't have a code of conduct on zero MQ, but I see that it's part of the C4 collective code That's construction right. contract. Although it's, it, which is probably a level up from a code of conduct combined with collaboration procedures or contribution procedures. There's also a development process, in fact. Yeah. The thing is, though, is that most of the codes of conduct I see for, say, conferences or other organizations, they usually call out specific behaviors towards specific groups or at least, mm -hmm. you know, mention marginalized groups or things like that. And yours doesn't. I mean, it's just if you cause stress or pain to others, you violated it. 
If you, yeah, if you cause stress and pain and you refuse to change, I mean, it's not yeah. about making mistakes. Anyone can say something right. offensive by mistake. People do sometimes have stressful times in their lives and they can be rude to people and that's actually fine. I mean, that's just humanity. But being persistent about it is trolling and is there the group has to look yeah. at this person and say, you, you leave there uh, was, and defend it, each other from that. There's a big controversy recently in the Scala Z community about this, about code of conduct. Part of the problem was the code of conduct was like unilaterally put up, or some people feel that it was, whereas yours is community built. That's part of the, the help. But yeah, it's a lot about how do you value contributions against rudeness? What is rudeness? One concern I have about yours, I, you mentioned that the way you know someone is a bad actor is there's pain from multiple people. And I'm totally like playing devil's advocate and trying to poke holes in this right now. If as a woman, I was on the mailing list and received comments that were hurtful to me, but there aren't any other women on that project, what if I'm the only one speaking up or as a minority? I think, I think this is where the notion that it's, it's you as a woman being faced by one bad actor and that's a problem that someone else has to solve for you or that the authorities have to come and involve, I think is wrong. I think that the group should be empathic to your your situation and should be sharing your pain and be very, very angry when someone comes in and, and annoys you. Are they? If well, yes, I mean they would be, absolutely. I think if I, I think this is this is also my problem with the code of conduct as a kind of um if it's well of course, policy is good and of course rules are very important. But I think that what I would expect to see and what I, what I like to see is that the group itself takes care of bad actors and does it as part of its work rather in than the end, having the authority. As as social pressure. Yes. And if someone in my, in my community is hurt by an outsider, I will defend that person like mama bear. I will come down as a ton of bricks on this person that's hurting them and say, who do you think you are? And, and I can be very, very, very brutal if someone does that. And I would be then seen by the people as being very rude, possibly. Although I, I don't use swear words generally, but I think that protectiveness of people that we value is very, very important. It's not just about the rules. It's about our appreciation of people that we, we, we work with and that we, we know and that we care for. I agree with you. And I want to make a plug for if you're wondering as a listener, you're wondering what you can do to make our communities and conferences more inclusive. The biggest answer is when you see something mildly offensive towards women mm -hmm. or minorities, just say that's not cool. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It doesn't it's require a formal complaint. It requires raising your hand saying this isn't cool. And many people saying that consistently. That's what changes a culture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, I want to go back to running the community in the sense that it looks like you have a chat room, you have an email list, um, you have your wiki here. What are the most effective ways that you found to open up communication within your organization? Well, because we're making software, the very best is GitHub, as it turns out. And in fact, it's just pull requests and discussion on pull requests, which happens sometimes. Huh. You you mentioned so, uh, earlier yes. that one thing you wanted to get rid of was back channel communication mm -hmm. and Absolutely. scheming. How do you do that? How do you remove that kind of communication? So you you force people to be explicit about why they're making a change, and that's part of the process. Is a change must be based on a clear problem description. Simply, you can't simply say I've made these bunch of changes, and I will then argue the changes. If you can't make a simple problem description and a minimal answer to that, then you're creating a mess. And usually when you have back-channel agreements, it's about making a mess. Um, <laughs> because, you know, it's like, I want to make all these changes, but I'm afraid people will be annoyed, so let's agree that you won't complain, I'll do this and something and the other, and then we back each other up and then we go and make this stuff and everyone's very offended. And in fact, you'll see really, really offensive projects that work like this exclusively. There's one famous one in the Linux kernel right now, which is based on nothing else than massive disruptive change. It's it's clear where the problem comes from. It's having too few people making too many changes too quickly. And so if you force change into the form of pull requests on GitHub, which can be which are clear and which are small and which are clearly logged and tracked, then you've removed the scope for back channel communication there. So you insist like on clarity to make, in the public communication. Yeah. That makes sense. You insist on transparency. Yes. Transparency. Clarity. So it's not that you can't like 
go offline and collaborate with your friend on something, but that you need to fully explain that to the public in the pull request. Yeah, you have to give a clear Even, value proposition to the community as to why right. it makes sense to them. And keep it small that's enough right. to be and comprehended by the community. Yes. And then and the, every, community, so every, the community culture doesn't back change just for the sake of change. So there has to be a reason for it. That's banned. I mean, the idea that you just come and change stuff because you like changing stuff is, is, yes. is, is considered to be vandalism. On the other hand, if you want to create stuff because you like creating stuff, even in the very simplest projects that we make, and this is for everything that we do now, the every commit message, with a few exceptions, is problem something, solution, mm -hmm. some minimal solution. That's it. It's and like writing a failing test. It's writing a failing test, and every single change is a failing test, and you've identified a problem. If someone doesn't like the solution, they can propose a different solution, but they'll agree with your problem. If they think your problem is a false problem, they can criticize a problem, and then your solution is taken off the table, can be taken out very quickly. I really like the focus on solutions, though. It's so easy to focus on the problems, and when you start talking about the solutions, it's really when you get stuff done anyway. Exactly. Peter, there's a line from the introduction to your Zero MQ book that I just love in relation to community <laughs> building. It was, the real physics of software is the physics of people. Mm. Oh, that's so true. And I agree. We can have all the theories we want, but or all the hypotheses we want, but if we want some sort of theory of how things work underneath to back them up, it comes down to people. Always. That's right. I was in a panel conference in a con software open source co so conference in Athens about almost 10 years ago. And there was this question to the panel of, you know, why do most software projects fail? I think it's a famous quote that if people build software like they build bridges, then they wouldn't fail all the time. And <laughs> the panel was struggling and saying like yes well software doesn't really obey physics like bridges do and i'm like objection and then i get this <laughs> famous statement but of course it obeys physics but it's physics of people and we're just not that clever and we can't handle that much complexity or depth of nesting or levels of abstraction we're we're not that smart although we think we are i have noticed a lot of people programmers like me are interested in cognitive science mm -hmm. these days in how do we think Mm -hmm. But you know, what I mean, what is the physics of people? Is that psychology? Psychology, anthropology, yes, it's sociology. economics, sociology, politics, biology, even to a large extent. Mm. Yeah, I would love to have a team full of people with those kind of undergraduate degrees. Yeah, and programming ex experience. I mean, it's funny how to become you know a successful software developer on a large scale. You have to do all of this stuff, really. Otherwise, you're working half blind. What can a member of a community do to make their communities better as an mm. individual? So it's very hard to change existing communities. It's really very, very difficult. And I've seen a couple of examples of people doing this where they have a open source project, which is clearly valuable and interesting and yet is really badly managed. And it's, it's typified by pain, different kinds of pain. It's painful to use. It's painful to contribute. There are, pull requests waiting for six months and not getting merged and, and so on. And you, you will see that the, the power structure cannot be changed. It's basically, it's, it's grown and it's, it's hard wood and it's, you know, it's dark wood and it stays the way it is. So if you are in a young project, which can be changed, then you can lobby and ask for cl clear rules. And I would, I would say, take the, you know, take our RFC 22 and adapt it if you want to modify it or use it. But rules like that, which give the right kind of balance between freedom and regulation. Good rules are very, very important. If you don't have that freedom to make good rules, then you can fork the project and you can redefine the rules. As zero and I've seen this you've done. got better yes. when it's split. Yes. Yes. And a contributor is, that's why we have open source. It's not just about seeing the source code. It's about making new forks and fixing the authority problems. Bad authority is toxic. I'm wondering a lot of these uh, things that we're talking about with bad actors and good actors and communication and all of these different things, it seems like they break down a little bit when we focus just on the technology. Do you think that's the core problem with a lot of these projects that fail? Is that the focus is on the technology rather than upon the uh, the interaction and moving forward? Or is it something else? I think they fail because they are not... Not, not applying science. They're applying magic. Most failing projects apply magic. They say, we believe, we believe in this and therefore we will invest in this 
based on belief and it becomes more and more just not even wrong but incorrect whereas a scientific process is always wrong it's always an approximation truth and accuracy but you can always get better and better by investing in different part mm -hmm. and almost by definition science is always good and it's always wrong it always gets better little by little and magic is always completely completely incorrect and gets worse and worse the more you invest in it or completely right is, if if you want to assume right. that because you believe if, in it yes if you want to just say well you know this is the way it is and you know pi has a value three and that's it and that's the well, that's that, the expert mind right that is mitigated by a group the expert mind without the group without without the group is a very dangerous thing yeah because without the group to tell the expert where to stop being expert and where to come back to being generalist, the expert goes off into make C++. I mean, you know, that's as bad as it gets, right? <laughs> what are some other great communities that you've found in open source or software or programming? I have to be honest and say that I'm only a contributor to my own communities. I'm very, very egotistical like that. <laughs> um, well, I imagine you spend a lot of time on this one. It's a big one, um, big community and the projects I can, I, I work on, I use, I mean, open source as a, as a thing has become beautiful in its, in its vastness, the, the amount of software that we have. I think all of it's wonderful. I think Linux is the whole ecosystem is fantastic. I think we've come, we've come so far from where we were when I began programming that I can't even criticize anything that we have. Even the worst cases are still amazingly good. I would hate to say that any one of them are particularly amazing. Other than yours. Sorry. Yours is clearly particularly amazing. No, I just think that with Serum Q, we've, we've gotten better at, you know, reducing the friction. I don't even think it's about the quality of the software. I think it's about making software with less pain and less effort and making it slightly more accurate and allowing it to grow more scientifically. I guess I don't that think makes it's sense. about, yeah. When you focused on the underlying causes of friction and of difficulty mm -hmm. and of obstacles, which are all people, and the mm -hmm. system in which the people are working, then beautiful software can emerge. Yes, precisely. You've also focused on value, <sighs> on solving problems, so that it won't just be beautiful software, it'll be valuable software. For me, that is how you define quality software, is by solving the right problems in an economical fashion. Hmm. Well, I've I'm... been looking for a good definition of quality. <laughs> my brain is it's totally my blown, I say. question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's it's a good thing. So it's my it's my conference question to the audience is how do you define quality in software? And, you know, it's this is it's accuracy. It's accuracy. It's solving the right problems and doing it without you know wasting too much time and money and pain. All right. Well, I have to actually start winding this show down so that I can do the next one. So you always ruin the fun. I know that's my job. So uh, anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and take us into picks. Uh, Jessica, do you have some picks for us? I have some picks. I had two, but right now I can remember one, so let's go with that. It's a food pick. My pick is goat yogurt. And goat yogurt is amazing and delicious, and I use it in place of sour cream. And it tastes like goat, right? Yes. It's made um, with goat's milk. Does that solve problems with like lactose intolerance and stuff? I have no idea, but it tastes delicious. It's got that little bit of tang like sour cream has, but it's just yogurt and, uh, yeah, good stuff. You can eat it plain. It's probably healthier than sour cream because it doesn't have the word cream in it. It's got to be good for you. My second pick is uh, an article that I'm going to find and link to about the broken stair. Uh, one of the tweets in response to uh, code of conduct discussions recently was, if the rest of the community tacitly accepts the behavior of the few, then there is no few. It's everyone. Mm -hmm. And the broken stare post makes this even more explicit. Um, and it's also about how we tolerating rape jokes and rape culture. And it's everyone should read it. So I'm going to pick it. And that's all. Awesome. All right. I went and looked up goat's milk. I have a dairy allergy. So I, I was like, I wonder if that would... Because I can't have sour cream and things, so this looks very... Oh. How about normal plain yogurt? I haven't tried it. Uh, I haven't been okay. that brave. I don't want to be sick for a day because I eat yogurt. I give that to my cats, and they absolutely love it. <laughs> awesome. That sounds fun. Jack, what are your picks? My picks. Uh, my first pick is a book. I'm halfway through it, but I can't put it down. It's amazing. It's called uh, Becoming a Key Person of Influence, and it talks about becoming a person of influence in your field. 
And I, I feel like I do some of the things there, but, you know, I kind of want to take my career, my, I hate the word career, but, you know, just kind of take my professional life and my life in general to another level. And so, uh, I was listening to, and this will be another pick. There's a series of videos, uh, done by Nick Unsworth called Life on Fire. And he was talking to Neil Harrington, who was on Shark Tank. Um, he's a, a big investor guy. He was one of the first people to do infomercials back in the 80s and 90s. And he was talking about this concept of being a key person of influence. And, you know, there are a couple of communities that I'm involved in that I don't necessarily want to be a person of influence just for the sake of having influence. But I feel like there are conversations that should be happening that I feel like I can kind of nudge a little bit to see if I can get people to talk about them. And the other thing is, is that I feel like if I'm going to be part of a community, then I really ought to get involved to the point where I can make a difference. So anyway, so I've been reading the book and it is absolutely awesome. So if you're looking for kind of that, that idea of where you want to go next and you want to be a person of influence, even in a small sphere, like a specific open source project or, you know, all the way up to, you know, uh, Ruby or something, I have to tell you that the larger, more established communities are harder to break into that way. Go check out this book. It's just awesome. And I don't know. Key person of influence. Is that just another way to say thought leader? Kind of. That's a little scary. But kind of. there's a big difference between influence <laughs> and control. And you yes. even made a problem statement there about discussions that you would like communities to have. Yeah. The, the thing is for me is that I feel like if I have influence, then I can open doors for other people. And if I have influence, then I'm empowered to, you know, build solutions either with software or other, you know, other things. Build solutions for communities that, that make them better. So one example is, you know, there are, there are certain areas that I feel like I could build software that would help the podcasting community. And it's still young enough and small enough to where I feel like I can gain influence there. And then I can go in and solve these problems and I can get enough feedback from the community because I have influence to actually make their lives better. So anyway, there are a lot of things going through my head right now with this because I'm still, you know, in the middle of the book and figuring out what it means for me. But, you know, I have to say that I've taken some tests and I've done, I've talked to a lot of people and done a lot of introspection. And uh, I have a lot of indicators that tell me that uh, one of the main things that gives me satisfaction, I guess, in my life and my career is social interaction and being able to help people. And so being that person of influence kind of solves both of those for me. And so, you know, if you're one of those people that likes to go quietly, you know, work in the background, then I admire you, but that's not the way I'm wired. Um, and I think those people are important too. So I'm not trying to, you know, say that anybody who's different is wrong. But for me, this is very much along the lines of the way that I think and the way that I want to make a difference. So nice. Anyway, so yeah, so, so they're pushing all my buttons in this book. So anyway, <laughs> uh, Peter, what are your picks? Well, I'm just starting a book by Karl Popper called The Logic of Scientific Discovery, English title, in 1935. And oh. Popper is a philosopher who basically defined modern science. I mean, the scientific method wrote about it a lot. Interesting stuff. That's one pick. And my other pick, apart from plain yogurt for cats, because the cats love full fat plain yogurt. It's, this has changed my life recently. This is Bluetooth. It's absolutely awesome. <laughs> like seriously, Bluetooth stereo headsets. They're like $15 on Amazon. And I have little Bluetooth adapters, my dongles. My living room is all quiet. I have three computers and a TV. All the kids are on different stuff and I hear nothing. Oh, that, so, that, that, yeah. Yes. It's really awesome. Nice. No cables to break. Yeah. I wonder if I could plug my kids into the TV with headsets. Can I, can I squeeze in one more question? Go ahead. Because, because Chuck, your pick made me wonder, Peter, why do you lead this community? Oh, Good world question. domination, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really, you know, there's zero MQ is only one step away from zombie MQ. <laughs> there's, there's, there's all kinds of software and this is zero MQ. Funnily enough, it's what we call revenge wear. What does that mean? Revenge 
software is when you, you make a project with some people and they screw you utterly, completely and totally. And you realize afterwards, and I won't mention any names because this is a podcast, but they're, they're total, not your psychopaths. And so you then dedicate years of your life to, you know, making stuff that actually works the way it should just to prove them wrong. <laughs> And it turns out to be a, you know, useful business and turns out to Bless make money you for and that. keep people happy. But problem. yeah, it's a revenge where everybody's got to be motivated mm-hmm. by something. <laughs> yeah. To, to, honestly, though, like, what do you get out of administering, administrating these communities? It's, it's really no work. I mean, it's really, it's really just, it's fun, first of all, to make these large systems work and to keep people happy. And it's not a lot of effort and it, it can't be by definition. It's got to be cheap and low friction. And I really like programming. I really like having these tools in my toolbox to use them as a programmer. They're really, really fun to work with. And I value them very highly and I'm protective of them for that reason. And just, it has just turned out randomly that these communities need people who can write RFCs and who can, who can enforce them. So that's been my job and I like doing it and it pays my bills and it's fun. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. And it gets me to bring, to meet lovely people like you two. Um, even if it's via podcast and that's right. I like this. Yeah, next time I'm in Belgium, I'd love to go to Belgium. Anyway. Belgium can, can be quite fun, Chuck. Yeah. Yeah, well, someday. I mean, it's not Las Vegas, but... Yeah. Oh. My grandmother grew up in Lyon, and I'd love to go back there and then go see some of the other countries around there. Lyon is nice. All right, well, uh, I need to wrap this up. I, I feel bad doing it, but I have to. So, thanks, you guys. It was a terrific discussion. Really, a lot of things for me to think about here. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to have to tweet a lot of things from the transcript. Yep. (laughs) Nice talking to you both. I really enjoyed this. All right, we'll wrap up and we'll catch you all next week. This episode is sponsored by Watch Me Code. Ruby and JavaScript go together like peanut butter and jelly. Have you been looking for regular high-quality video screencasts on building JavaScript done by someone who really understands JavaScript? Derek Bailey's videos cover many of the topics we talk about on JavaScript Jabber and Ruby Rogues and are up on the latest tools and tricks you'll need to write great JavaScript. He covers language fundamentals, so there's plenty for everyone. Looking over the catalog, I got really excited and can't wait to watch them all. Go check them out at rubyrogues.com slash watchmecode. This episode is sponsored by Mad Glory. You've been building software for a long time, and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Work piles up, hiring sucks, and it's hard to get projects out the door. Check out Mad Glory. They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, will augment your team, and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Would you like to join a conversation with the rogues and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at rubyrogues dot com slash parlay.